uh, and also director of the Early Years Community Research Centre, which we'll be hearing lots more about. Um, we will be, uh, as we always do with these, recording uh, this session, and then it will be available through the uh, CUN website and uh, other channels. Um, I think uh, Debbie and Sally will probably speak for maybe 20, 25 minutes, uh, and then we've kept some time for questions. Um, if you can uh, drop uh, your questions, just write any questions into the uh, Q&A function um, on at the bottom of the screen. Uh, then we will uh, pick them up and uh, invite Debbie and Sally to respond. Um, uh, also, obviously, use the chat function if you'd like to just share any comments or thoughts or links, um, then uh, please do that uh, as well. Um, good. OK, uh, let me then, uh, without uh, further ado, hand over to uh, Debbie, who's going to start just by, I think, putting our early years work into a little bit of kind of context in relation to our wider civic agenda. So, Debbie, over to you. Thanks, Richard. Um, so my name is Debbie Squire. I'm the head of place and civic engagement at Hallam University. I've been part of the team um, developing and delivering the Civic University Network since we started in 2020. So I'm absolutely delighted to participate in a webinar to talk about one of our projects at Hallam um, in, in, in the early years space. Um, if we can have the next slide, please, Helen. Um, so in, in our current climate of growing interconnectedness, universities are increasingly recognised as key drivers for positive change within our, our localities. Beyond our role in education and research, Hallam wields a significant influence that can be leveraged to address our, our pressing societal challenges. For about the last six years, we've worked collaboratively in our region of South Yorkshire to improve early outcomes through community engagement, research and policy influence. Our initial theory of change was underpinned by an evidence base of the importance of early years to child development and future life opportunities. And this has matured into a deeper understanding of creating the conditions for change, for meaningful change. We've aligned with other organizations sharing the same strategic objectives of improving early outcomes and addressing health inequalities, including our four South Yorkshire local authority areas, the South Yorkshire Combined Mayoral Authority and Save the Children UK. We've worked collaboratively with early years teams from our full local authority areas on a number of projects such as early years workforce initiatives and early language development, which have generated income to the region and for Hallam. So the slide shows some of the areas of work, uh, but we'll talk today in some detail about our early years community research centre, which is our hyperlocal demonstrator site based in Sheffield. Uh, and this has led to improved outcomes for children and families and has provided additional benefits to Hallam through student projects and research opportunities, plus some wider benefits which we originally hadn't envisaged. If I can have the next slide, please, Helen. Um, so the Early Years Community Research Centre, the EYCRC, was funded through a DfE Innovation Fund, which provided capital money to refurbish part of a building alongside a primary school in Sheffield. Our role was to develop the funding bid in collaboration with our partners and to oversee the delivery of the nursery, including establishing the operating model. Um, that one sentence kind of encapsulates something like two years of uh, incredibly hard work, uh, which all culminated in the nursery opening in 2021. Uh, the EYCRC is a cornerstone of Hallam Civic University Agreement, which is our articulation of the, the civic impact in our region across South Yorkshire. Uh, it was first published in July 2021, and we're currently undergoing a refresh of our CUA, uh, and the Early Years Community Research Centre remains a key commitment. Now the next slide, thanks. So from the outset, our ethos was changing lives through relationships. Um, and I'm gonna hand over now to Sally, uh, to Sally Pierce, who's gonna talk about those relationships uh, and the impacts that they've had on the on children and families in our communities, uh, plus some of the wider benefits uh, that we've been able to realise for Hallam. Over to you, Sally. Thank you, Debbie. Yeah, really thrilled to be here this afternoon to talk through the, the work we've been doing in the Shycliffe area of Sheffield since 2021. As Debbie said, this was never, it was never the intention to open um, and, and simply a nursery. We knew we wanted to have wider impacts 
And one of the sort of cornerstones of that was this um, changing lives through relationships and using trauma-informed practice as a way of really building trusting relationships with the community that had just come through the pandemic and is still facing the, uh, the cost of living crisis. Next slide, please. It's really important to say that this is a collaborative approach. It's built on a really strong partnership between Sheffield Hallam University, Save the Children UK, the local school, uh, the NHS and Sheffield City Council. The area where we operate is one of Save the Children's five early learning communities in the UK. These are demonstrator areas where Save the Children has, um, has focused on bringing about system change so that the services for naught to five children and families are more joined up and actually address the challenges that, uh, that families are facing. And from the beginning, we have worked so closely with them that uh, our families on the ground don't know who works for Hallam and who works for Save the Children. They just know that when they come to the centre, it's a safe and trusted place. Next slide, please. Um, as Debbie said, it's, uh, we envisaged the Early Years Community Research Centre as a hyperlocal demonstrator site. So there are a number of ways in which we've operated probably slightly differently to a lot of nurseries. Um, and this is about that focus on building relationships and trust. So before we start, so our children start at the nursery, we have home visits uh, to find out as much information as we can so we can effectively support children and families. And we've got a real focus on co-design, not assuming that we know what are the most important challenges to families at the moment. And this is an approach that, uh, that Save the Children have, have brought to the centre. Uh, one of the first pieces of work we did was um, a co-design with parents to say, what would actually make the biggest difference to you? And what they came up with was a breakfast club, not for children, but for parents to address mental health needs and social isolation. This was envisaged as a, as a four week project and two and a half years later, it's still running and has become really at the heart of the centre. It's where parents come to meet to get a hot meal, but also to access information and support. There's a whole other range of ways in which we operate slightly differently in terms of our support for special needs, but also in terms of, of how we work through relationships uh, with relationship mapping of the relationships between practitioners and children and families. Um, some of the other areas uh, are probably quite common to other nurseries, providing training courses and information to parents. But this has gone um, certainly further than my experience of, of providing this, as our parents have gone on to train to become community champions, community researchers. And in the last week, they've started to train as trainers to deliver a knowledge to nurture course so they can provide the support to other families that they've received themselves. I'll talk much more a bit later about meeting immediate need and how that's helped us to build trust as that's culminated in a programme that's been launched uh, by our South Yorkshire Mayor today. One of the areas that is, is, is still growing is um, our commitment to, to providing community events and trips as a way of really building community cohesion and community memories, um, some things that we might take for granted. But for a lot of our families, the opportunity to come together to experience things outside of their own community has been very limited. And the nursery staff and Save the Children um, took over 40 parents and children camping last summer and over 50 to the seaside. And we're building on that with sort of more extended trips this year. Next slide, please. So that's very much focused on what we're doing out there in the community, but it, those the benefits of providing this, this civic sort of tangible project is really felt back in the university across a whole range of subjects in that it gives us huge opportunities for knowledge applied uh, projects for students. And since we opened, we've provided opportunities for our architecture students, early childhood studies, education studies, disability studies, courses that you might expect like initial teacher education where students can come on placements, more unusual ones like film production, fine art um, and long-term placements for those working on courses to support children, families and young people. The most interesting one of these I think from our perspective was where we brought together architecture students and early childhood studies where, um, to design outdoor play space at the nursery um, as they were both able to bring their expertise together 
um, and work collaboratively on producing plans for developing the outdoor play space. The opportunities provided have, have, have varied from things that are sort of built into modules, um, as it was with the architecture students, um, to where the, the students from disability studies came in and audited our centre for accessibility. Um, and as a result of their audit, we responded and made changes, which we then fed back to the students. We've had internships for film production master students working with both Save the Children and ourselves at the nursery to tell the story of some of the families that access the centre and to bring that to life. And one of the biggest projects we're working on, I'll come to a bit later, has involved our fine arts students in curating an exhibition of families' work. Next slide, please. It is the Early Years Community Research Centre and research has been developing over the last three years in a number of areas. When we first opened, our staff team moved from the nursery that we already had at the, uh, on campus to the new one um, in the community outside. And it was a huge shift, particularly as we were coming out of the pandemic. Um, so the needs of the families were, were very different to those of the families that were accessing the campus nursery. And we were quite concerned for staff about what that would mean for them. And we spent uh, a year researching what that changing experience was and what additional training or support our practitioners might need. Interestingly, by the end of it, um, what came out of that research was that although it was initially daunting moving to the new centre, that the practitioners actually felt far more valued um, as professionals by the families using the research centre nursery than they had from previous families, um, and that they really valued the opportunities to develop their skills in multi-agency working, special educational needs support. And we take the learning from that uh, to look at how we can further um, offer, offer opportunities for our practitioners to develop. We've had research opportunities with Save the Children UK and have published joint research briefs. We've trained parents as community researchers to investigate what are the support networks that families use uh, through eco maps. Um, we've published guidance to relationship mapping as we've found that's had a big impact on parents and practitioners relationships. And it's actually led um, to a, a, an EEF funded project, which I'll speak a little bit more about later. Next slide, please. The profile of the centre and the research opportunities that we've had um, has allowed us to have a much higher profile in the early years sector and to be able to disseminate this research in a number of ways. Most recently, I was involved in a UK RI funded sand pit on levelling up, where we use some of the information from the centre to present to policymakers what it's actually like for families facing multiple insecurities in the community in Sheffield. We've disseminated our research through the government stronger practice hubs for early years, and we've fed into the Department for Education on their away days and are also looking at policy pilots as a result of the work at the centre. We've worked with partners in the early years, such as Frobel Trust and Early Education, putting on joint CPD and training. And we've had high profile visits from the likes of Bridget Philipson and Helen Hayes and Dame Andrea Ledson. Next slide, please. One of the opportunities that having this sort of focused approach to early years has had is it's brought academics at the university together in a space where they've got the opportunity to talk and work through what they can see happening in practice. And this has resulted in myself and a, and a colleague having a successful bid to the Education Endowment Foundation for a, a, an early language programme that is now going through a, a pilot stage and may well go on to an efficacy trial if we decide that's the best way forward. Um, this came at the time as we were coming out of COVID, so it was also adopted as part of the COVID recovery programme. So we've received three years funding, uh, part of which is the pilot and the other part is delivering this programme through the Stronger Practice Hubs. Next slide, please. One of the most exciting things I've alluded to before is the, the work on co-design and co-construction with parents um, and families within the community. And along with Save the Children, uh, this has led to an art exhibition that will be taking place in our Institute of Education from April into May. 
this has been really guided by what the messages that parents wanted to give back to policymakers um, and to the, the local authority and to ourselves as a university. So they named the exhibition Seen, Heard, Valued. They want to be seen as individuals, not just as parents. They want their voices to be heard and they want their opinions to be valued. They've worked on a number of art projects, including a community quilt, um, lots of different artifacts. We've got children's artwork and um, the, the Merrill Authority has been involved and has um, actually supported us to advertise the art exhibition on the bus shelters between the community and, and town and vice versa. Um, so it's actually there for, for parents to see that their work is being valued and is very visible. This has been a fantastic opportunity to bring people together from across the university. So we've got our fine art course leaders um, involving their students in actually curating the art exhibition. And today um, we had parents and children from the community working with those, uh, those students and course leaders looking at the artifacts to decide how they were best going to be displayed. And this, the, the whole art exhibition will be launched um, with a reception on the 29th of April. And we've had really good positive engagement uh, from a wide range of people who will attend that initial reception. And for Save the Children, um, they're finding this a really good way of engaging with policymakers. So it will also have alongside it a series of round tables to engage policymakers from different areas um, of expertise uh, to actually hear the voices of families and to understand the lived experience and as I say it will be hosted in the sort of the open public space in our institutes of education. Next slide please. The work that we've done in the in the civic arena in early years um, has been very successful in income generation um, in the bringing funding in for the 0 to 5 age group for, for families in South Yorkshire. It equates to the equivalent of about 4.9 million in the, the, the years that we've been operating. And that's been in a series of quite large projects, such as the early outcomes, um, which is, is, um, was looking at speech and language services within the region and looking at how best they can be brought together to meet the growing need for uh, to support children's language. Um, we work together with the local authorities to bring another EEF funded pilot for intensive home visiting for families that weren't accessing any other support. Um, I've already mentioned um, the, the Twitch programme and the funding that that's bringing in across the region and also the school nurseries capital innovation pot that allowed us to open the research nursery in the first place. But the growing profile of early years has also generated income for the university itself. Um, in terms of um, some of the ones I've already mentioned, but also our links with the local authorities has also led to successful um, applications to evaluate large scale projects such as the family hubs, but also smaller scale um, bids uh, to, with, with local authorities, with smaller trusts such as Shine to really explore what is effective practice in early years and how can we contribute to making the biggest difference to children's lives. Next slide, please. So we've been open for three years. We had a theory of change when we started of what we thought we were going to impact on. And we really, really wrestled with the metrics that we were addressing. One of the things that we were set up to, to address um, was attainment. But more and more we've realized that what we're actually doing is working on creating the conditions for change so that there will eventually be a shift in those metrics but it's much more about a way of operating. And this is the learning that has been really interesting with, to, to work through with Save the Children, and I'm sure will um, impact on the evolution of our partnership with this organization. When we came to review it, we realized that what we now understood was we really needed to work through the community conditions with the community to understand what life was like for parents and families. And from this, we um, have drawn up some principles and values about the way that we operate. We said at the beginning that our sort of strap line is changing lives through relationships. And that has become even more central and important to what we do, as we've grown to understand that it's through the trusting relationships that we build up with families 
that they're open to accepting support and welcoming support and telling us what kind of support would actually make the most difference to them. A nursery has a particular place in doing this. Um, I would say this because I'm absolutely committed to it as someone who believes that early years has the power to transform lives. But what it has is it's, it's, always, it's always there in the community. So the points of contact with families are repeated, frequent, consistent. It has the same staff team there day after day so that families don't have to keep retelling their story. This is one of the things that's come back to us again and again is families feeling that they're failing in some way because they have to keep telling about the story of what's going wrong with their lives or the challenges that they're facing in order to be able to access support. But if it's a service that's there day after day, they build a relationship, we know what's happening for them. We view our support, they view our support positively and we take an asset-based approach, a strength-based approach of uh, families working on, on what they, they do know, what they can do rather than what they can't. From this, we've developed a range of interventions, um, such as uh, firstly, the nursery places for children, the co-designed breakfast club, using a lot of creativity and arts that have led to the art exhibition. And what parents said was the most important thing to them when we first started was support around social connection and mental health and the knowledge and information to support their children's health. And as a result of this, we have run several courses uh, called Start Well, We've put in support around nutrition, which was something else that parents said they really wanted, and support around oral health. Um, we've developed community cohesion through the events and, uh, and trips, and we've supported children uh, from, uh, with special educational needs and their families through our um, dandelion group. So we're now starting to understand that if you have those principles and values and we have interventions that are co-designed and come from parents, that it creates the mechanisms for change. The first one of those is, is co-design, widening participation and engagement, and developing evidence-based practice through that co-design. This has sort of enhanced the social networks between um, families, and we've actually been able to practically put things in place to improve living and social conditions through our partnerships with Save the Children and other voluntary sector organisations such as Baby Basics. And this provides the opportunities for change. We're now seeing a range of outcomes from that work. They're not the long-term metrics that I think we were working with originally, but what we have seen is that reduced social, iso social isolation uh, and improved community connection. And a lot of um, parents telling us that it's improved their confidence having this in, within their community, and that's leading to opportunities to train, volunteer and work. In terms of the children themselves, having the nursery and the focus on uh, special educational needs is leading to earlier referral. Peer support for parents through those parents that have trained as community champions and community researchers and across the community, a better awareness of, of health and nutrition. We're now taking this learning and looking at what else we can develop within the early years space. Next slide, please. To avoid sort of the accusation of we're just marking our own homework um, in terms of the Early Years Community Research Centre, we did commission some external research by the Ideas Alliance, who worked with our uh, practitioners in the nursery, spoke to our partners, and worked with the parents, um, developing them as community researchers to actually look at what impact we were having. The picture you can see with the words in is the word cloud that the families produced uh, during this um, impact assessment. And for me, this was absolutely thrilling because what the, we actually explicitly set out to create a safe space for families and to build those positive relationships. So the words that we used to describe their relationship and feelings about the nursery um, and the work that we, we do within the centre seem to exemplify our, our ambition. And the, the summing up that the Ideas Alliance came to was it's the, the development of the Meadows Nursery, that's the, the name we give actually for the nursery itself, had been key in helping people feel anchored in safe and safe. And the feedback about the nursery was universally positive and that sense of safety being so important to enable not just children, but the parents and carers to flourish as well. And a recognition that we're addressing this in an area of high need where often there are not nurseries because market forces do not allow with the current funding levels for them to operate and be sustainable. And from this work, we have built community connection and community cohesion. 
Next slide, please. On the next couple of slides, um, there are parents telling their own story about what access to the Early Years Community Research Centre nursery has had for them. And in both these cases, Brittany has, has told her story herself. Um, and the, um, the uh, parents on the next slide, Lena, uh, has also done the same. But interestingly, this morning, we had um, Look North, Calendar, the local radio, Five Live radio um, at the nursery to launch a project that we've been working on with the Merrill Authority for the last year called Safe Space to Sleep, um, looking at the, uh, the issues of bed poverty um, and the mayor is committed to £2.2 .2 million funding um, over the next two to three years to, to meet that need. And both Brittany and Lena uh, were interviewed on the radio this morning, just showing their, their confidence and willingness to tell their story to, to support others. So Brittany has gone from um, sort of first accessing a nursery place to being a university researcher herself into homelessness, which was something that she'd experienced. And I'll just give you a moment to read that slide. Okay, next slide, please. Lena's story is also incredibly impressive in terms of the, the, pro, the, the movement that she's made in her life, the achieving of her aspirations um, since we first met her. Um, when I first met Lena, she'd just come out of, of lockdown with her two little boys and husband in a one bedroom flat with no access to outdoor space. And it had been a really, really stressful time. Um, she's now come on, as you can see from this, this slide, to passing her driving test. She has trained as a, a teaching assistant, as a community researcher, and last week she started training as a trainer in the Knowledge and Nurture programme so she could offer um, the support that she feels that, that she's received and has, has helped her to develop to other parents within the community. Next slide, please. This is something that has sort of has, has taken us a little bit by surprise. When you've worked in a university for a long time, you sort of tend to take the word university for granted. Um, and as part of the art exhibition, the scene heard valued, we ask parents to write to people that they wouldn't normally hear their voice, things that they'd like their counsellors to know, things they'd like their local authority to know. And for this person, it was something they'd like the university to know. Um, and we were so taken aback that this was the impact of just having the name of a university within the community. Um, the first page, just to explain, this, this was somebody uh, telling their work coach that their child accessed a university nursery place and seeing the surprise on their face. Um, and I'll just read out the second part. So this is a letter of recognition and the impact it's had on my, we my well-being my children's well-being and us as a family. Having Sheffield Hallam University part of our community in Shirecliffe has really made me feel connected to something bigger, better, and makes me want to push myself and my children and our education and learning. I now feel like anything is possible for me and my children. When I tell people my child attends a nursery that is part of Sheffield Hallam University, it makes me feel proud and that I'm not just a bum. As a family, we feel valued, and I know that we are respected as a person, child, a human being. I'm not a nobody, I'm a somebody. The presence of a university in a local area is amazing. Other universities should do this. Next slide, please. So we've taken a lot of learning from the partnership working, collaboration, co-design with parents that has taken place over the last three years. And we want to take that model of creating the conditions for change onto the next level. Um, we're looking at how we can bring together the real importance of addressing early health needs and early education and care needs into one centre. Uh, and we're looking at the potential to develop a new centre in the South Yorkshire Investment Zone, which will be part of the Health Innovation Campus that will be developed there. We believe this combines two of Hallam's areas of strength and reputation and builds on that significant grant funding and partnership working that we've demonstrated at the EYCRC and which our colleagues in the um, health and well-being and life sciences 
school have, have been developing, particularly working with marginalized groups and black and minority ethnic women. There's a real synergy between the approaches taken by both areas in terms of that co-design, community support and empowerment. So it's a bit of a watch this space, but this could be an area for future development. Next slide, and which is questions. All right. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Debbie for uh, starting us off. And then a um, uh, huge thanks to Sally for taking us through um, the, the story of the uh, the nursery um, and um, some of the experiences we've had. And it's it's always great to uh, to hear the story. I, I, Sally and I have been involved um, with this since since we first thought about this um, um, five odd years ago. And um, every time I engage with it, whether it's a visit or just listening to the presentation, now, there's always some further development and, and, and some further angle. I think one of the things that's been interesting for me, um, you touched on this, Sally, um, several times, so is you, you, the civic work that universities some, sometimes do can it, it can sometimes feel a little bit disengaged from real from communities at a real local level. You know, we talk about our impact on the economy, we talk about our, our wider impact, but this is something that really steps down into where a community is and it engages with with real people in in a way that, um, well, in the way that I think you've brought to life quite well. And I guess one of the most interesting things looking at it now is is how how the nursery has become a catalyst for, for so many other things to, to develop off it, both within the university, uh, within the community. And, and actually, I think that you also mentioned how much interest there's been in this um, at a policy level, both uh, locally, politically, but also nationally, and, um, and, and some of the lessons that come from that. Um, and I'm sure there are going to be some questions. Actually, there's a, there's a question which flows on quite quite nicely from what I was just saying uh, from Rebecca there, which is um, uh, which is about policy influence and um, and kind of what, what would you like to say about that? Perhaps Sally, do you want to pick that one up? Yeah, I, I think this is probably an area that's that's developed quite recently and and has gained some some momentum. And a lot of that is to do with the this really strong partnership with with Save the Children. Um, we're actually just about to produce a joint policy brief about the work um, at, uh, at uh, the centre uh, because of what we've learned about the impact in communities that are disadvantaged and are sometimes missing from the policy agenda at the moment around early years, where it's framed as childcare for working parents rather than the impact it can have on parents who are on that journey towards work um, and those uh, uh, the change it can also make for, for children. So I think we've got a stronger voice in that policy area through that partnership, um, but also within Sheffield, we've got the policy campus for the civil service, and we've got quite a lot of interest from DFE, Department for Education, um, about um, our understanding about how you create the conditions for change, very much that theory of change that um, um, they, we met with them last week to look at whether there's a possibility of us having a policy pilot uh, within South Yorkshire or within Sheffield to explore that further with their behaviour insights team. So it definitely feels like it's something that um, we're gaining a voice in. Um, and I think a lot of that is to do with that strong partnership working. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, uh, some follow-up questions, some further questions are they coming in. So uh, let's, um, uh, let's, pick, uh, let's take the next one. So... Um, yeah, do you, say, could you say a little bit more, um, Sally, about how the community reacted to a university setting up a nursery? There was quite a nice little bit in one of your quotes towards the end there about um, about university. But just, just say a little bit more about that and the wider community reaction. I think that's something we were really concerned about before we opened, that whether it would seem sort of a bit alien within the community, whether they'd make... Uh, people might make assumptions that it wasn't for them, that it wasn't for the for the local community because it had the university branding on it. Um, before we opened, we probably only had about four children signed up. Um, so that was, was an initial fear. Um, but we needn't have worried. Within a very short period of time, um, word got round about the nursery. We were full within about two weeks. We then had to double the numbers. We then had to expand the numbers again. Um, and we're operating at capacity. Um, 
And I think that is to do with uh, the, the approach that we took as well, your emphasis on creating a safe space for, for children and families. Um, but certainly families seem to stay with us. We sometimes get over 40 people at the Breakfast Club, which given the fact we only have 40 families attending is quite incredible. But I think they continue to come back to us now that they know it's a safe space and they trust us and we respond to the needs of the, of the local community. So although it was an initial concern, I don't think it needed to be really. I don't know if you want to add anything there, Debbie. Yeah, I think just one thing to add, really. I think Sally mentioned the nursery is called the Meadows. And I think we did think quite hard about that. But opening up a research centre for early years um, felt like a, a not quite the right message to give to the community. So the, the research centre aspect is, is, is very much, um, you know, not the front of office, as it were. So it's the Meadows nursery and the community know it as such. And we didn't want to convey a message that could be misinterpreted by calling it a research centre and the potential sort of you know, misconceptions that might bring. But having oh, said oh, oh, sorry, I'm no, Sally, carry on, please. <laughs> going, but having said that, they the parents are now really interested in being involved in the research and seeing the impact and having their voice heard. So I think we've almost come all the way around that now we have got parents who very proudly say they are community researchers um, and families wanting to engage with policymakers again, say this morning, absolutely no difficulty um, in talking to the media and the press because they want their voices and their life experience to be heard. Great. Um, just uh, just to, um, I think people are doing this, so I probably don't need to remind you, but if you do want to ask a question, just uh, please type it into the Q&A. Thanks to Rebecca for those first couple of questions. Um, let's go on to Leanne's question. So, um, so firstly, uh, and, Nice recognition of uh, Twitch, still going strong. Um, but then the question is, what, what would you say the key thing is that people in other areas could or should adopt as a, as a first step uh, in this area? Oh, that's an interesting one. I suppose it's, if we go back to the theory of change, it's really understanding the community conditions and who are the partners that are already operating in that community so that you're building on what already exists and where families feel comfortable going to and who they feel comfortable speaking to. As I say, we're, we're looking at we're exploring the possibility of whether we could replicate this elsewhere. And that's very much the learning we'd be taking away is we'd be present in the community for a period of time beforehand, working with the people on the ground, understanding what was happening for, for families before we even took any, any further steps and sort of putting in co-design from the beginning you know, explicitly saying that whatever we were developing, it would be with uh, the lived experience of the people within that community. Yeah, I, I think that's, I was just trying to think back myself as well, Sally. I think that just having the confidence in some of those early partnerships as well was, um, uh, that was important for us. It wasn't just us as Sheffield Hallam um, going in and uh, and setting this up. Um, that those yeah. partnerships were, were, were an important Absolutely. Yeah. The early learning community uh, they sort of predated the, the work we were doing. So Save the Children already had a presence in that community, which is why that collaboration and partnership is so important. Apologies, the lights have just gone off. I will just see if we can get them back on. <laughs> That's all right. Keep moving. Uh, in the meantime, uh, let me uh, let me jump on to um, uh, let's jump on to the next question. So question from Laura. Um, yeah. Um, the transition when children progress to reception. Um, Who'd like to take Sally? Are you? Do you want to start again, or, or I'll let you start, Deb, Sally, and then hand over to Debbie yeah. if you'd like to. But yeah, this was something we were a bit concerned about because we work very closely with the school in in setting up the nursery, and they take children from age three. So actually, the children transition to us very quickly. We only have them for two to three terms, um, and the last thing we wanted to do was undermine the viability of the local school or compete with them for any of the of the age groups. So that has been a little bit of a, of a challenge, um, but we, we've got really good transition arrangements in place with the school. We do multiple visits, we're taking the children to them. They come and visit the children uh, to make sure that's as smooth as possible and that the families feel supported in, in that transition. But um, yeah, it's, it, so it, it, it's working well, but it, it is a little bit of a downside not having longer uh, to work with the children. But what we find is that the families keep coming back. We know that one of the things they said to us, which makes absolute sense, is I don't want to lose the relationship with you just because because my child has a birthday. There isn't anybody else I want to go to for support. Mm -hmm. So it's so important that we're still there for those families that have come through the nursery 
and they continue to access support and services um, you know, beyond the time that their child attends. I think it's probably just worth mentioning you do a lot of work across the school and the setting as well in terms of practice, in, in, in terms of uh, CPD and, and, and training with the school practitioners. Yeah, and we follow the same trauma-informed practice approaches. They've been through the same training. We've got people who are trained to their diploma level in trauma-informed practice so that we can really focus on building those safe relationships uh, in both sites. OK, um, quite, still got quite a few questions to go. I'm just going to jump around a little bit. I will try and cover them all. But um, let me just jump next to the one from um, uh, around Save the Children. Just a little bit more about what's the partnership with Save the Children um, meant. Yeah, um, to say that uh, it's, it's been absolutely invaluable uh, to us as, as one of their five early learning communities. We're able to share learning with other places within the UK that um, have also been deemed to be experienced socioeconomic challenges, but are very different. So Feltham in London, Margate, um, Betis in Wales um, and Belfast. So there's, there's that, that shared learning that's important. Um, but the staff team, um, I'd say, is, is seamless on the ground. We have got extra capacity, which we wouldn't have as a nursery otherwise, in terms of the staff they have. We have a research and innovation officer, an early learning community officer, um, and somebody focusing on data and evaluation. Um, it, from that local level, we also you know, to the, to the, go into the, the national level in terms of that influencing and producing policy briefs and research briefs together. And they've got a fantastic person who is their national influencer. I think we need one of those. Um, and uh, she's, you know, to, to make sure that we we sort of uh, are able to disseminate the impact um, of the the work that's happening in Sheffield as widely as possible. OK, thanks. Um, I'm just going to uh, say I'm just going to jump around a little bit, but I will pick them all up. Let's come to June's question. Um, uh, firstly, we're really positive about parents, children and the community being listened to and respected. But um, uh, Sally, can you say a little bit about um, the trauma informed uh, approach uh, that you take? Yes, certainly. Um, this is an approach we've, we've taken at Hallam through our teacher training for quite a number of, of years now, recognising the long term impact of adverse childhood experiences, um, at both physical and emotional and, and mental health in the long term. So really focusing on what we can do in the early years um, to support children and families, make sure that we don't re-traumatise in, in any of our approaches and that we really build those, those strong relationships. Um, so one of the, the things that we, as, as well as training staff in that approach up to their sort of uh, diploma level, making sure they've got the key relational skills to, to, to build the relationships with children and families, We've developed some of our own tools. So we use the relationship mapping tool to check that every child has um, an emotionally available adult that they are, feel connected to and feels connected to them. And we do that same relationship mapping for parents and carers as well. And if we think that somebody is perhaps you know, sort of not connected in, uh, we don't know enough about them, then we'll take extra steps to try and build that really strong, positive relationship. Um, it's creating a space of, you know, a space of, of safety. So it's around making sure we really support those transitions in. We understand what's impacting on families and try and address some of those immediate needs um, so that families are then in the space to, to access other support and services. So the project we've worked on sort of with, with the mayor really speaks to that, about if people arrive um, with, with, with sort of worried about food or fuel or not having a safe space to sleep, that we address that first. Um, and then work on on um, supporting families in other ways. Right. Thanks very much. Um, let's come on to the um, question about workforce challenges. Challenges. We haven't talked so much about this in, as a challenge. We've talked a little bit about the staff and how the staff grew. But um, the question from uh, twelve minutes past three: um, Do we face the same workforce challenges as the wider childcare sector, and and how do we manage that? Yes, we absolutely do. And as Debbie sort of said in one of the first slides, we, this has been one of the focus of the, of the wider work that we do uh, in the space of early years with our local authority partners and with the, the mayoral authority. Uh, but yeah, we face exactly the same, the same challenges, uh, recruitment. Um, our retention is quite good, but where we have got vacancies, we really, really struggle to recruit as other people do within the sector. 
Uh, one of the things we've done at Hallam to try and address this on a wider basis, and um, it's through the apprenticeship levy, through pledging uh, our unspent levy to the um, uh, matching funds that the mayoral authority holds. And we've ring fenced that to early years, but that really helps the wider sector, not us, because we can't sort of access that uh, that ourselves. Um, but we're, we're the, one, the other pieces of work that we're, we're doing also is using our film production students to make films of local people who've just moved into the sector and those that are career changers to show that although we, the pay and conditions may not be ideal, it really is a, such a rewarding space to, to work in, in the hope of attracting more people in. But yes, the, the, the challenges are huge and, the, and we, face, we face the same ones. Thanks very much. Um, let's come to the, yeah, let's come to Sarah's question um, uh, around um, funding and initial funding. Um, Sally, or, or Sally or Debbie, actually, I, I'm not sure who's, who's best to pick this up, but um, where did the funding initially come from to uh, get things started? Do you want to just kind of talk about how we, how, how it got going in the first place from a funding perspective? Do you want to talk about the fund, Sally, and then I can pick up on some of the wider fundraising? The initial funding, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so the initial funding, um, uh, so it, it, just to rewind a little bit, we were working with the local school because it was school nurseries capital funding that we were uh, wanting to access to develop the, the, the nursery places. And as a university at this stage, we were going to be supporting around sort of CPD training, research, um, so we were we, we worked with the school to put in a successful bid to the innovation pot of capital money uh, and unfortunately the pandemic hit and the school were absolutely taken up with um, dealing with community needs so which is why the university has such a big role um, in this in the nursery space uh, because at that point we stepped in to say that we would take on the the registration and the running of the of the nursery but still through that strong collaboration so we managed to get enough capital money to bring the children's centre nursery back to life. It had been closed down in the first sort of round of austerity cuts um, a decade previously. Um, so the money was just to refurbish the building and for large furniture. Um, and it was quite difficult getting it through to that point, as Debbie's alluded to, through, uh, through the pandemic, trying to get building, overseeing building work and getting that completed. But at that point, we did have sort of a functioning nursery in terms of beautifully refurbished site with some furniture and I'll let Debbie pick up there. <laughs> yeah, but as, as, as Sally says, it was capital funding. So there was no funding for other things in the university, uh, in the nursery rather, beyond uh, large items of furniture. We meticulously ran lists past DfE as to what we could or couldn't buy from the, from the capital funding pot. So we were really fortunate in Sheffield to be able to tap into um, organisations that had got together to for Sheffield Business Together, uh, where there were corporate social responsibility agendas. Um, and we were able to get some of those organisations to come and support us with some in-kind work. So we had um, uh, Henry Boot came and did some of the outside space work as part of their, as they say, corporate social responsibility agenda. We got donations for some of the sort of the, the, the reusable things and some of the consumables within the nursery itself. We had some furniture donated, um, the white goods. So uh, there, was a, there was a whole fundraising set of activities that went on. Um, Sally did some extraordinary marathon running to raise funds. Um, and so it was really, uh, you know, just trying lots of different avenues to get the funding to actually get to the point where we could open with a fully functioning, sufficiently stocked nursery so so lots of roots really and it was incredible the support we had from the businesses within within the Sheffield community and just to say the, the other funding that's been brought in since again is through that wonderful partnership with Save the Children that they uh, brought in philanthropic donations that have allowed us to uh, have a wider offer for parents such as children being able to start on the day that they're two rather than the term after being able to provide lunchtime uh, so that for children can stay all day if there's a need so that it's continued to bring in, in funding from, from different places. Yeah. And I think one of the things from that early phase was, it's that thing we talk about a lot with, with the civic agenda in, in universities and place agenda is the convening power that the university can bring. And just the, the sort of, co even if it's not about the university putting in lots of money, um, 
the confidence of the university's engagement and, and the ability to join institutions up, I, I think was probably quite, quite an important piece of that early work, wasn't it? It absolutely was. And having a tangible project that it could be, you know, used for other corporate social responsibility agendas that people could work on, that people could participate in was really important. And we were able to bring a, a lot of groups together to, to work on, on, on that sort of tangible real life project that they could then see results in front of their you know eyes and, and get some real good engagement and experience for their staff. So it had lots of good positive effects. Good. Okay, uh, we're, we're getting close towards um, last, well, I think we're, we're, we're close towards finish. Time for one last question. I have been saving up Laura's second question from uh, 308 um, as, as the last one, because it sort of takes us on a little bit to um, uh, where any of this might go uh, in future. So uh, Laura says, how do you see this rolling out further to other nurseries um, across Sheffield? And I might just kind of broaden that out a little bit and say, is, is there something, I mean, you've, you've talked to, um, to a number of uh, politicians and others, Sally, um, obviously in the early years is an area that we know um, Labour are very interested in in terms of their manifesto thinking. So where where, where, where further could this go? It's an interesting one, yes. Uh, trying, trying to be realistic and um, <laughs> at the same time optimistic. Um, so we've obviously, we're trying to maximise the, uh, how, widely we disseminate the findings around engaging parents and co-design with parents and, and what that can lead to and having those policy discussions both with the potential, the current government, potential future government and with the, the, the civil service. I think interestingly, we've also made quite a lot of international links. Um, there's a lot to be learned uh, from, from other countries about how they're approaching that sort of community-based uh, um, approach to, to early years education and care and work with parents. Um, so we're looking at writing a book that brings together examples from all over the world of uh, nurseries that, that operate in, in similar ways. In terms of local influence or regional influence, we run um, a free CPD network where we also talk about the work that we're doing and that anybody who is in early years practice or in academia can, can come to. Um, and we, we work with local authorities in terms of putting some of our training um, into their programs um, and also speaking at, at their events. So there's a, an influence in, in that way. Um, and there's obviously the, the work that we're doing around the investment zone about whether we can take all the learning from this and some of our colleagues in health um, and reproduce this on a larger scale um, as a, a, an operating sort of research centre and community resource. Yeah, I think it's one of those things. Look, it, it's going to be interesting seeing what happens um, over the next um, over the next few years in this space. There's clearly huge, huge need, but there's also some really, really good learning and lessons. Um, it needs investment. It needs all sorts of things, doesn't it? But there's there's, um, it, there's there's certainly a huge amount of interest in this, and and I think for something that started with you know quite quite small beginnings, it's um, as we said a few times along the way, it's it's created so much kind of interest and reach and um, and lesson learning. Um, we are pretty much at time, um, everyone. Uh, I'd try and finish at least a couple of minutes before the um, uh, the half hour. Um, can I uh, firstly say a huge thanks to uh, Debbie and to Sally for taking us through um, uh, both presentations and, and answering uh, all the questions so, uh, so thoroughly. Uh, thanks to all of you for your participation, uh, your questions and engagement. Um, uh, just a quick uh, quick plug for upcoming events. We've got um, uh, some events uh, coming up uh, looking at different universities and cities' approaches to uh, civic agenda and civic agreements. We've got uh, University of Bristol on the 17th of April, Newcastle and Northumbria uh, in May, 21st of May, and University of Exeter. Uh, 22nd of July. Um, keep an eye on uh, the Civic University newsletter, uh, CUN uh, website. Um, there's uh, lots of new things coming on for, uh, all the time. Um, great. Uh, thank you all very much. I hope you found it interesting. Uh, if you've got colleagues who uh, you think might be interested, then do point them uh, in the direction of the recording, which will be uh, available very shortly. And um, thank you all again. Thank you.